All right, welcome back into uh, the second part um, of the introduction to fixed point math video. And we left off looking at scaled integers um, and how we add them. And we saw that adding them was pretty simple. Um, you just add them. We just have to keep track of this imaginary scale factor. Now, we left off, what about multiplication? Um, and this requires kind of the next leap um, to understand multiplication. So let's look at it just mathematically here. If we have two numbers, x and y, with a scale factor of multiply them, this is what we get. Noticed, uh-oh, we don't have the scale factor in front of it. We have the scale factor squared in front of our result. So when we have a result, it's now different. Um, there's a new scale factor. If this was 10 and 10, we have a scale factor of 100. So it turns out we actually increase precision as we do a multiply. So what do we do with this? All right, uh, it's simple. After multiplication, divide the result by the scale factor, and you can move on. All right, and that'll get us back to if we divide this result by, you know, n, we get rid of this, that, the, uh, this n squared. Now, we're going to see later that this is not always true. You don't always need to divide that out because you might want a higher precision intermediate result in a computation. But if you want to get back to your original scale factor, you need to do the division. All right. So, caution. All right. Caution. Do you have enough bits to handle a multiply? Think about this. 8 times 8 bits will yield a 16-bit result. So if this is 8-bit number here and this is an 8-bit number, all right, uh, you may need, because we have a scale factor squared, you need additional bits to handle the precision. So if you're using C, you've always got to keep this in mind. Whatever you're multiplying into has to have more bits than the source variables. All right? They have to. Or you have to ensure that the numbers are so small that you ha never have more bits. Uh, you know, that you can uh, you never have more bits than your data type can allow. But almost always, universally, you your whatever you're multiplying into has more bits to handle it. So let's look at some, once again, some pseudocode. So I have the same problem. We have a scale factor of 10. Uh, A is 5 and 6, which is 0.5 and 0.6. Um, now, notice I have an intermediate variable, and it's a short. And right now I'm dealing with unsigned numbers. We're going to move away from that a little bit. But um, all I do is say A times B. What I'm going to do is multiply into the result, uh, this result here. So if we take A times B, 5 times 6 is 30. But this number is scaled from the true number by our scale factor squared. So what do we do? We're just going to say C equals our temporary variable. Oops, there should be a little underscore in there. This is why it's pseudocode and not real code. Um, now you think about if we did, uh, divide it by our scale factor of 3, or I'm sorry, scale factor of 10, the result of C is now 3. All right? Well, and that makes sense because we still have a scale factor of uh, 10 in front of a result, and that gives us a true value of 0.3. So it works, all right? But the key is you have if you want to get back to your original scaling factor, you have to uh, uh, rescale it with a division. Um, now, C temp, we could have left C temp in a, a scaling of... Uh, 100 of a 10 squared. Um, now, there's sometimes you want to do that and you don't want to, and we'll look at an example later, but you have to understand every time you do a multiply, you have this, you have this artifact. Um, all right. Now, it's not that hard to deal with, but it is there. Now, 
the scale number ranges. Here's the here's the nice part: is whether it's signed or unsigned. Integer math is integer math. It doesn't matter. You can use two's complement. So, um, if I have b is the number of bits of storage, um, the range for an unsigned data type is zero to two to the b minus one divide by my scale factor. So in the case of a scale factor of 10, all right, two to the, if we use an eight bit number, two to the seventh, I'm sorry, that's two to the eighth minus one equals 255. All right, if we divide it by 10, the largest number we can get is 25.5. Now, if we have signed data types, remember signed data types spread the range. So all we do is the same thing, is that the range is the integer range. We just have this divided by large n. Now, um, and then 1 over n is the smallest number you can deal with. All right? It's always 1 over your scale factor. Now, here is the beautiful part, is it doesn't matter if in your data type, if you have, say, a 32-bit scale number range, if you're working with big numbers, big uh, integers, or small ones, 1 over n is always the distance between two numbers that you can represent. So if I have one number x, if we go to the x plus 1 over n, all right? This is always this, and it doesn't matter. Floats, that's not necessarily true. It depends on a lot of things, the two, you know, the orders and magnitude of the operands. Um, so what is neat is that we can control precision uh, very precisely. <laughs> you know, it's, uh, we can control it uh, very easily. So and it's just 1 over n. So if we want more precision, we just choose a bigger scale factor. Now, what do you lose? All right, what do you lose? Well, floating point numbers, because n, you can think of n is continuously variable depending on the order of magnitude, we can represent a large dynamic range. Well, fixed point numbers, it's a fig, you know, the range is smaller. The smallest number to the biggest number you can represent uh, is fixed. And that's why it's called fixed point. It's um, um, and that may be the problem. So you got to you got to figure out in your numbering system what's the biggest and smallest, and choose this appropriately. Now, how do we choose it? Um, choosing the scale factor n. Well, so if our scale factor is ten, the smallest number we can represent is point one. All right. Now, why did I choose base 10 scaling, all right, uh, of all things? Well, the, the reason I did it is in the examples, it's really easy to see what the true number we're trying to represent is. 5 is 0.5, 66 is 6.6. 6. We can simply, we work in a base 10 arithmetic during the day. You know, we're not doing computer work. It's all base 10. It's easy to see. Um, the problem is, is that it's not only necessarily the most computationally efficient, but it is easy to see and you're welcome to use it. So how do you choose the scale factor? Well, that's up to you. Um, and it depends on how much precision do you need after the decimal place. Maybe 0 0.1 is good enough. Maybe it's not. So, and I always ask my class, how do you see, uh, do you see any problem with using 10 as a scaling factor? Now, what do you think about that? Well, after a multiply, we have to perform an integer division. All right, that's just universally true to get back to our... Now, the, here's the problem, is multiply is easy to do in hardware. Addition is division is trickier. This may require uh, sequential logic internal of the chip, and it may take many cycles. So, someone might ask, are there scaling factors that don't require a division? Now, what do you think about that? Is there a number we can pick that's non-trivial, like 1, 
like scale factor of one is it's a plain integer that doesn't require a division operation. Well, let's think about this. We have the concept of what's called binary scaling. What if we choose a scaling factor that is a power of 2, 2, 4, 8, 16, or, you know, 2 to the sum n? Well, think about it. How do we divide by powers of 2? All right, every embedded systems programmer should know this. You bit shift. Remember, anytime you bit shift to the right by one position, you divide by 2. Now, I can tell you right now, bit shifting, a bit shift instruction is a much, uh, a much easier instruction for a CPU to, you know, to deal with than a division, you know, a full integer division. Um, now, using power of two scale factors is called binary scaling. So from here on in, we're going to talk about binary scaling because it's easy. Now, can you think about why you wouldn't want a binary scale. Well, the first one is, is that, all right, if I'm dealing with numbers and let, let's say an integer in my code and I'll get, and let's say we have the integer of 13, all right? If we're using a factor of two, well, the number we're actually representing is 13 divided by two, all right? That, yeah, okay, I, I can, that's 6.5. I can kind of figure that out. But the problem is, what if you have more complex integers like 23, 57, and our scale factor is 16? What's 23, 57 divided? It's hard to do in your head. You can't directly look at the number and know what you're representing unless you're an idiot savant. You can just do large division in your head. Um, so this is the probably a difficult part of... Um, it's kind of a difficult part of binary scaling, but it's very, very efficient. And it turns out almost all signal processing operations you will ever see are binary scale because we want to take advantage of the fact that adds are cheap, multiplies are cheap and easy, and bit shifting is cheap and easy. And not only that, you can get certain processors, say a Cortex M4 core, that can do all of those in, say, one instruction. Now, the other kind of neat part is if we use binary scaling, we get this concept of a virtual decimal point. If we look at a number, and I'm going to I'm put, these are all binary. These are not represented in like base 10 or hex. An unscaled integer, here's 8 bits. Well, if we have a scale factor of 2, just imagine a decimal place one place up to the left from you know from all the way on the right we put it here if we have a scale factor of four we have two bits over three bits over so if our scale factor is eight eight is two to the third power the so three means we move one two three so if you look at the number in binary it's easy to see where the decimal place is at and this is where why we call it fixed point numbers, because the decimal point is fixed in the representation of the integer. Um, and I'm going to say where it's virtually for our number. Remember, this is all imagination time. This is all imagination time. We're just imagining a decimal place there. Um, the way it's being computed, it's still an integer, um, but it, it, it's, it's just virtual. So that's a nice part about of binary scale numbers. Now, to interpret it, it's pretty easy. So what you do is, let's say you want to have a binary number. When you're learning binary numbers um, early in like a computer architecture course, you, you kind of learn to, let's say the green is our one number. Above each one, each column, you, you know, kind of have its value. So this is two to the zero column. This is the two to the one column two to the second um oops, let me redraw that this is the two to the third and you simply take this value times whatever this value is add them up now what we do 
And on the left side of the decimal place, it just goes the other way. 2 to the negative 1, 2 to the negative 2. So that's a 1 half, 1 fourth. You know, we'd have 1 eighth, you know, 1 sixteenth, so on and so forth. So let's look at a real number. So if we have these bits populated, all right, we have a 2 to the 1th, which is a 2. We have a, a 4, so that's a 6, all right? We have this bit. A one fourth, so the result is 6.25. So if we had the binary number 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 0, 1, and assuming a scale factor of 4, 6.25. Now, if we want to represent in hex, if we write 0x19, that number with a scale factor of 4 is 6.25. And this kind of what makes it tough to look at. Pretty much in every embedded system, you, you primarily look at numbers in like hex, you know, so it's kind of hard to see, um, you know, what, you know, what the number is. Now, if we choose a scale factor of n equals 16, we could put like a decimal place like right there, and it makes it a little bit easier. Um, but that's just how you interpret it. It's no real harder than regular binary numbers. We just have the decimal place in these placeholders to the left of it. Oh, I'm sorry, to the right. Now, let's go one step further and generalize maybe a certain format of fixed point numbers. And this is where we're going to have what's called the Q number format. So this is not necessarily a standard. It's more of like a de facto standard of how everyone chose to uh, represent numbers. Fixed point binary scaling can certainly be done with signed or unsigned, but is most often used with signed data. Because you think if you have a signal, it goes positive or negative. Well, the Q number format is just a common way of talking about signed binary scaled fixed point numbers. So we have signed numbers, they're binary scaled fixed point. All right. And so we write it as qm dot n, all right? That's a common, you know, nomenclature where q is just saying, okay, we have q, we're talking about q, and I think of that as like the sign bit. That's the bit representing the sign. We have a number, the number of bits to the left of the imaginary data point or decimal point, the number of bits to the right of the decimal point, and where, you know, n is the scale factor, I should say, 2 to the n. So if this is 7, it's 2 to the 7th, which is 128, is our scale factor. All right. So let's look at an example of Q. So if we have a Q7.8 number, Q, we need one sign bit. All right. We have 7 for the integer part, 8 for the fraction. So a Q7.8 needs 16 bits of total storage, um, which means we need a signed short. All right. Remember, this is just a 16-bit twos complement number. We're simply imagining that the number is scaled by a factor of 2 to the 8th. It's simple imagination that our number is scaled over by uh, 2 to the 8th, by 256. But it's just a 16-bit number. Now, if you're thinking ahead a little bit, you know, you could say, well, what's its range? Well, it's pretty easy. Um, you know, we just take the range of a 16-bit number, divide it by 256. All right. So we get plus 127.996, negative 128. Uh, and then our smallest number we can represent is this. Now, you'll notice that that's not a nice even number like 0 0.001 because we're not dealing in base 10 anymore. We're dealing in base two. Um, but one over 256, that's our granularity and what we can represent. Um, it turns out that's not too big of a deal because if we're doing signal processing, we choose a fairly large, you know, fractional part so we could represent the numbers. And just because they don't make sense in base 10 land is, is kind of meaningless. Now, if you need base 10, uh, then just work with a base 10 scaling factor. Uh, just keep in mind, you have to pay for it with that 
that nasty integer division. Um, so like I said, if you're thinking ahead, well, if this is all imaginary, well, we got a problem. We can have a lot of different interpretations for a Q number. So uh, we can pick whatever we want. Now, if I have 16 bits to play with, I can have a 7.8, 8.7, 9.6, 1. Dot, you know, uh, 15. I'm sorry, this should be 14. That is incorrect. All right. Um, that all of these would fit in a 16-bit number. All right. Now, I'm going to make a point here. If we're using a programming language like C. All right, we we can't work with arbitrary data. It's, it's it would be dumb to to you say I want twelve bits only because we can work with eight, sixteen, thirty two, or sixty four bit if you have a higher end CPU numbers. That's our data types. Use the whole width of that data type. Even if you need twelve bits and that's the biggest number, go to sixteen because you got it. Um, remember. A, say, for example, a Q78 number just looks like a regular integer um, whenever you use your debugger. We're just imagining, we're just imagining that the number has been scaled from its true value. Now, if we're an FPGA, it doesn't matter. We can choose arbitrary widths. Now, it turns out an FPGA, you might not either. Um, for example, why might not you? Well, if we're in a Xilinx, FPGA, all right, they have built in like nice 18 by 18 multipliers. Uh, so you might want to use numbers that are a multiple of that 18 or 36. But you could if you wanted to. Nothing is stopping you. You could use 5 bits, 8 bits. But when you're programming, using a programming language, you, you've, you've got to, you want to use the native data types like in, in the language. So, um, so what we're going to do is we're going to take another break. This ends part two. So I want you to go through, think about, um, uh, you know, think about this concept of the Q data type. Now what we're going to look at is, you know, the first video, uh, you know, I don't know, you know, we looked at numbers with the same scale factor. All right. Well, it turns out you can actually deal with numbers with different scale factors. This happens all the time in that you may have a system where you have different scale factors floating around. So we're going to look at the Q number format uh, and, and how do we deal with that, you know, in part three.